Hello. Um, well, I have two. This is like, there should be tracks attached to this. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to start off, and I was here last year, and I think I only made it through my talk. I think I drank five or six club mates during my talk. And uh, it was, it, it's, and, it, and it's because I'm in front of uh, what I consider to be the smartest, cleverest, most intelligent, most able to fuck shit up audience in the world. And I like you. So um, I'm going to be talking about prototyping stuff <clears throat> and a little disclaimer. Mostly I'm making all this stuff up. So um, I'm, I don't propose to be any sort of expert on really anything. And so I'm sure some of the things I talk about, um, most of you are going to, or some of you, if not a lot of you, are going to know a lot about. Hopefully I can make it interesting enough that, um, that it's interesting. OK, so right now we have a kind of an interesting situation. We're, when we want something, um, we, we generally buy it from some corporation that's manufacturing it. Uh, but um, it's just about time for a little bit, something a little bit different. Um, uh, just, I'm just kind of curious how many of you in the audience either create, uh, create code or create objects and that's create, that, how many of you create something in your life on a regular basis, just out of curiosity? Okay. How many of you create physical objects by yourself? Okay. Awesome. So this is a talk for you. Um, so right now, let's say I want a clock. And the way it works is I go, you know, I want a clock because I should really be on time for something. And uh, so I'm going to do some shopping. For me, I like to shop on the internet. I go, OK, let me get it. I found this cool clock. I'm sure it's made by a Scandinavian. And um, I go and I f try and find the coolest manufactured clock in the world, and I buy it. I actually uh, don't own a clock. so. Uh, there's an alternative reality, though, that I'm kind of excited about. This is my friend Justin Day's binary clock. When we first started NYC Resistor, before it really existed, we would go out and drink. And we started talking about how cool it would be to have a binary clock. And Justin sort of held this together in his mind, and six months later was like, finally, I'm going to do it. And he pulled together an Arduino, a bunch of LEDs, and had all sorts of problems trying to figure out how to actually make it work. But finally, it worked, and he made this this binary clock, and really, he's the only one who can read it. <laughs> this is a little bit of a different experience than getting something from Scandinavia. Um, so I, as, when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about, like, OK, what was the last thing I made? I made a robot for Robo Exotica. And then what was the last thing I bought from somebody who made it? To make that robot, I actually bought a Twitchy kit from Raphael who creates these, uh, an Arduino platform that's optimized for servos. And then I started thinking about, what do I buy secondhand? I'm kind of in a state right now where basically I'm, I only buy food and stuff for projects. So I haven't really bought anything secondhand recently. But I've been staying with a friend who's obsessively good at obtaining really cool stuff for free, usually because people throw it out. And, uh, and a lot of us already do this in some way or another, whether it's through Craigslist or eBay, or maybe you make things and sell them on your own site, or you go to a flea markets regularly. This is all kind of like, this is all subvert, all this stuff really basically is subverting a corporate, like, consumerist fueled, centralized manufacturing paradigm. That's, okay, I won't use say that again. Um, <laughs> But the idea is like instead of instead of going from the center out, we're like going across. I'm almost I'm I'm near I like I know there's cool stuff that I want every single year, but for the most part, I'm pretty confident that there's enough tables and chairs in the world to last me whenever I move into a new apartment that I don't need to go and buy a new table or chair. And it'll probably if I get it from somebody else and it's lasted sixty years, it'll probably be what I want. It'll probably last a lot longer, I mean. Okay. So I was thinking, like, what would it be like if we actually had to rapid prototype everything right away? And I started imagining, like, what would it like if, be like if I was like on one of these, these shows where 
you're on an island and you have to make up everything. And I was saying, that would be pretty cool. You'd have to do the whole wa figure out the water thing. I, 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 I would really probably enjoy that. And then I thought, well, what if instead of having to be on an island, we just did that anyway? And I really like this idea. And I'm, I think it would be really fun. So, um, so I don't know what I was thinking here. Okay. So, oh, I know what I was thinking. So, um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this idea of rapid prototyping is um, like, what would it be like if you could just say, you know, I need this right now, and and you could and 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 then you would just make it exist. Um, here's a little video. Hi, my name's Eric Michaud. I'm from Chicago. Um, Sorry about the stuttering of the video. NYC resistor on the way back from Malaysia. Three in the morning comes around. I'm really hungry, and uh, people have ramen in the place. But the problem is, no one has any utensils. One of my friends here says, "Oh, I used a knife." I'm like, "That's blasphemy. We have a laser cutter. We have to do something better." So my friend Adam and I over here decided to put together on CAD an actual fork. And basically, we decided that this would actually work just fine for ramen since we're not really having to cut it or have to deal with any detail. So we threw up a QCAD, brought it over to the laser etcher, and basically, by the end of five minutes, I had a really tasty cup of ramen and an actual working fork. How good is that? It's working great. <laughs> Indeed. So I really like this idea of being able to just be like, I need something, and then it exists. So this idea of like making whatever it is you need when you need it and doing it in your space is really different from this dominant corporate manufacturing model. And it's also really different from another model which a lot of people talk about with this idea of fab labs. Fab labs, for those of you who don't know, this is kind of popularized by the, um, the folks at MIT. And they make these little boxes that have all these really fa all this fancy equipment in it, and then usually they send it to sort of uh, underprivileged areas where they kind of hope that they get utilized, and sometimes they do. And it's a place where people would go to have something prototyped. And um, I really don't want these machines in boxes that people have to go to. I really want them like in people's living rooms or in people's hacker spaces or places where people go regularly and they're just there so that when you need something they exist. Okay, so the bonus points of making whatever you want whenever you need it is like it's fun and you end up feeling proud about it and you learn how it works so when it breaks the next time, which it surely will, then you can fix it and you'll discover things about, about you know, things and you can customize it and make it whatever color you want or shape. And the other bonus points is you could then sell it or uh, if you could put it on, you could share it with the internet and people might make it, maybe, and, uh, and if so, they might make it better when they do it. And uh, it's interesting, a lot of people, when they think about this without having done it, they think, oh, I don't want to let my thing go, somebody might copy me. But it turns out, if once you've done it and you've seen your idea out there on the internet and you've seen somebody else made it, it's like having, I mean, I'm sure it's not actually like having a baby, but it's really, <laughs> it's, it's, it's this real sense of, of, of pride in seeing your thing out there in the world. So, uh, I like this word digital design. I like this better than Fab Lab. I like this better than a lot of words. And in many ways, rapid prototyping, the, really you can rapid prototype anything if you have a big enough hammer, I guess. But, um, what I'm mostly talking about is this idea of digital design. Creating, you imagine something in your head, you somehow transport it onto, um, in, di, into a digital format, and then, and then you make it. And then it's made for you or you make it. So there's this whole process of like design to object. And this is where, if you're getting into digital design or rapid prototyping, a lot of people get bogged down here. You've got Inkscape, QCAD, Illustrator, Rhino, Art of Illusion, or Corel Draw, and if you've used any of these, you know that they're really unpleasant until you know how to use them. And strangely enough, no matter what you use, as soon as you are an expert at it, it's the absolutely best thing and all of the rest suck. Um, you can kind of get around this if you, have, if, if, um, if you are smart. 
and you can have a magic wand and you can make a design go from your head to a digital file. My friend Jared does this. He loves to play with uh, Flash. He's a Flash obsessionist. And so he takes, um, uh, he takes like algorithms, which he thinks are pretty, and then sees if they're pretty in the real world, and then he makes things like, he th takes his laser cutter and throws stone in it and, and, and makes designs like this, where he didn't draw any of this. This is all some sort of data of some sort. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's pretty. Okay, so um, how much, what, uh, what is my, let's, let me look at time. Oh yeah, I'm doing just fine. Let's give you a quick Inkscape, tu Inkscape tutorial. Now, many of you, I'm sure, know how to do this. For many of you, this is going to be boring. For some of you, this is going to be, this is a way to, get, to see how easy it is to get into digital design. And um, uh, I'm just going to show you this real quickly because I, I've, I've been teaching laser uh, design classes at NYC Resistor. And it turns out, so what I usually do, what I did before the holidays is I, I said, oh, it's a Christmas or holiday ornament class. And you come and you make a holiday ornament. Well, everybody came and I said, okay, quickly make a little tree, a little shape. And um, okay, if you want to do this, you can go ahead and laser cut it out. Or if you have an idea in your head and you want to be ambitious and you use your 12 inches by 12 inches of, of acrylic in some creative way, go for it. I'll stay here as long as it takes. And it turns out that this most, that when you throw down something like that, it turns out everybody has to do something. Nobody made an ornament. And in one case, there was a, 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 a Mike G. He went ahead and st we were there until 6 a.m. And then we just fell, both fell asleep on the couches. And then we woke up and he worked on, he made a really cool model of a, a working model of a lock out of clear acrylic. So, okay, I'm going to now attempt to do a little tutorial in Inkscape. And it looks really normal up there, but up here, over, it's really wide, so bear with me here. Oh, now I'm starting it up. Uh, Inkscape is, for those of you who haven't used it, it's a vector design program. Uh, commercial options would be Adobe Illustrator. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> those aren't the robots you're looking for. Okay, so when you open it up, you get something like this. And this is approximately the, sheet of, uh, the size of a sheet of paper. So we want this to look like the inside of a laser cutter. So let's go ahead and pull up the properties. And we're going to make the width. Oh, first we have to change this to inches. Yeah, we're still imperial. I know. <laughs> Thank you, whoever worked on this program and gave me that option. I appreciate that. I know. I know. Okay, so uh, I also want to go ahead and make a grid here, and you just do this by clicking new, and, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, and let's make quarter inch units approximately, for those of you who don't think that way, that's like three millimeters, I think. So, no, I'm wrong, that's like six millimeters, right? Yes. Okay, moving right along. Okay, here's my, um, my thing that's really too big for this uh, size of, yeah. So here we go. Here's a grid, and um, I'm going to go ahead and use this little tool here. This is basically something, and it's nice when you go float over, it says what it does. And I'm going to, let's see, we could do, there's this, there's this nice snap thing, and I like this snap thing. I made all... It's interesting, I spent about two, three weeks where all I did was go. <laughs> all I did was this, and oh, now I've done it. I sort of broke it. And um, oh, now I just totally lost my train of thought, that's okay. Anyway, it, one of the things I've noticed is it's actually really hard to talk and, uh, <laughs> and design at the same time, so. I'll try and wrap this up. Um, I'm sure there is 90, there's a 100% of you who could do better than this. Um, anyhow, ba ba ba. Okay, I've got a little friend here. <laughs> Let's give him some eyes. 
I so don't deserve that, but I appreciate it anyway. Okay, um, there's a... Let's see if I can fix it. Oh my gosh. So the nice thing is I can highlight these and move this and, you know, you get the idea. So then what can happen? This is such a sad little creature. <laughs> okay, so then what I want to do before I, I, I export this is I'm going to, or I would, before I save it, is I'm going to go ahead and add something that is one inch by one inch. And I know that this is quarter inch, so it's four. And I'm going to erase this later, but it turns out that right now with our laser cutter, you have to import your files into CorelDRAW. And CorelDRAW sucks. <laughs> I mean, some people love it because... <laughs> because they get used to it and it's their, it's, they understand it. But I, I really don't understand them. So one of the things that CorelDRAW does when you import it is it, it can freak out and it won't understand units. And it'll, it'll have the right perspective of everything, but it will be like each unit is one mile instead of a quarter inch or something like that. So uh, you usually have to resize it and it turns out it's a lot easier to resize it if you have like a square unit that then you can make a grid like we've got here and then resize it. And then uh, you save it, and it'll save as an SVG, which is a really, I like that file format. You can save it as other things. Inkscape's really flexible, I like it. Okay, let's stop this. You get the idea. Okay, I'll draw it, save it. Okay, where's my presentation? Okay, no, that's not it. Uh. <laughs> okay. Yay! Okay. Uh, I can, four. yes. From four to three? Yes, because we're a full streaming team. Oh, okay. Nice. Let's see if I can do that. Um, would you like to come up and do that while I'm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's go here. Maybe this is happy. May I? Please. But, but you continue talking, right? Okay. Um, okay, so um. then this actually happened before. Um, when, we were at Robo Exotica a year ago, and uh, I, this, I always mess up the display preferences of some sort. Here we go. Okay. So, um, okay. You're Thank you. Tim. I told you I wasn't an expert. Okay, so let me just make sure I told you everything. I did, great. Um, so, uh, that's like, right now, every one of you could call yourselves a digital designer if you wanted to. And the nice thing about this is, with that, with what you just saw, you can actually uh, design so many things, and um, you don't have to have a laser cutter, you could, you could print it out put it on a piece of cardboard and do it that way. Okay, but what do you do when you have the file and you want to share it with the internet? Um, uh, me and my friend Zach, who is going to be giving the RepRap talk tomorrow, uh, decided we were going to make a website in an hour. And it's called Thingiverse and it's a place where you can share object files. And um, really he's the person who's good at making websites and so it's actually quite nice. And it's a place where if I thought that character was worth anything and I wanted to share it with the world, I would upload it there and then anybody could download it and make it if they wanted to. I'm not going to do that with that particular one. But I've done, I've done, the, I have lots of, all my designs go up there and you can all do whatever you want with them. Okay, look, a monkey! Um, so this is a little story that I like that I 
I, I think I started to tell the story. I don't know how far I got. So I decided I was going to make, with what you just saw, I was like, I basically did that for like two weeks where I made these characters. And this is my first one. I made a monkey. And it was slightly see-through, so you could see its skull inside its head. I really like this. You can see its heart inside its, its body, too. And um, I made a little comic that showed people how to make it. And I, I laser cut about 50 of them, thinking that the whole world would just really want this. And people who collected those little miniatures would buy these up and collect them. I sold two. <laughs> Sometimes the world doesn't want what you offer, and that's OK. Uh, but the nice thing is, is I went to sleep, I made it, I, I published it, and I woke up in the morning, and my friend Martin, who's of laser and laser.de, he has a laser here in town. He had seen the thing, and even though I hadn't published the design yet, because I just published it before collapsing, he reverse engineered it and then made it better, and then took a much better picture than I had. And this is one of those times where you make something and you share it with the internet, and it gets better. Um, I really like this. So uh, let's move on and talk a little bit about rapid prototyping history. Da, 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 da. Uh, so this is a really wonderful old school CNC. Uh, it's not CNC, it's an NC mill. And this is actually currently in the Vienna Technical Museum, which is a really fun place. I'm also looking forward to going to the Technical Museum here, which I hear is pretty awesome. And it is controlled with tape. And I saw this and I just thought, this is really something cool. And it turns out, this is what the tape looks like. And isn't that pretty? And um, I'm not sure what exactly this says, but it, I'm sure it says something like, change the x value, go move the x value until it hits 23, or move the y value until it hits 42. And then it says, OK, next one. And there's a little, over on the right-hand side of each tape, there's like a marker that says like every 20 dots, and it's very satisfying to look at. Um, oh, let's go. So then the nice thing is after this, um, this, this came out in 1949. And in many places, this is still in use because they're freaking reliable. You, when, you're, when you've designed something, you design it, and it outputs a, a roll of tape. So if you want to make it again, you just rewind the tape. And then if it breaks, you just use scotch tape and you put it back together. And so they're kind of like, they're uh, bulletproof. OK, so what, this is that kind of thing. And big machines, uh, in many ways, are out of the reach of individuals. So of course, you have to do it yourself. Hi, I'm Marius. And I'm Philip, and we are from the RepRap research team at Metalab. Indiana, Austria. Here you can see a RepRap ShotBot, which is a robot that prints out shot glasses. This, this RepRap was developed by Guy Pettis and a team of hackers here at the Metalab last year for the Cocktail Robot Festival Robot Exotica. It failed and it burned. We replaced most of the electronics and we fixed the new extruder and now it prints perfectly again. Now it's pre-printing a shot glass to toast its own birth. Here we have a temperature sensor and we have a heating element and it just heats and the plastic it gets squished, it gets pressed down here by the screw and so yeah, it's molten in here and then extruded in thin filament. I love the, I love the melting, I'm, yeah. We drink to the birth of a rep rap. Ready? Car. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> Drinking, a very important part of robotics. <laughs> so they. Uh, so last year I brought the, a rep strap with me to Vienna and left it, and then, as they mentioned, it completely. It, it, you know, smoke is how robots express love. And, um, and then they got this CNC, they had this CNC machine hanging around that they'd bought and was kind of, and they, they took the little Dremel thingamajigger out and they custom made a little rep wrap extruder spot that fit right in there. And this was a little bit more, they've made some really special things. You can check out Metalabs.
Actually, their soup is really good. The, if you go reprap.soup.io, you can see a bunch of their projects. Okay, the, I'm gonna make ah, you suffer through this. This is freaking awesome. <laughs> Hi, I'm Devin Jones from NYC Resistor, and this is my uh, gantry router. This is a computer controlled uh, Dremel that can uh, carve into wood, um, uh, foam, acrylic, whatever, to be able to carve out designs as you make them on a, uh, uh, you like draw them in a CAD program, and then you can carve them out uh, to do really, carve out whatever you want. And this is the uh, first successful test that we've had. I've been working on this for a very long time, and to see it actually do something is a fantastic feeling. <laughs> okay. Uh, so th there's kind of a theme going here. If, if you notice, like, the people who, if you, actually making a robot work is like, I won't compare it to sex, but it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, this is a, this, uh, a guy I know, Bruce Shapiro, out of Minneapolis, and he has a site called The Art of Motion Control, or actually it's called T-A-O-M-C, and he loves to work with uh, motion control. So. One day he was sitting around and it was almost Easter and he had a few extra stepper motors and he likes these kind of computer, the old laptops that have uh, parallel ports. And so he just slapped this together and then he makes this thing that decorates eggs. Why not? It's great. It's really, it's, a, and the other thing about these things, if you get into this is, I don't care how, how bad your ADHD is, because I know we all have it in, pretty strongly in here. No matter what, you have to, when a, your robot is moving, you're, you, it doesn't matter, you're not looking at anything else. It's really satisfying. I had the same experience with uh, Drawbot that I made with some friends at HackerBot Labs. This is one of those times, this is kind of my first uh, project like this where I was like, let's make a drawing robot that takes your picture and then draws it. And, I, and then I have no idea how to do this. So um, I ended up getting some friends involved in five pizzas and five cases of Mountain Dew later. This exists. Uh, the Evil Mad Scientist Laboratories are this uh, great family in San Francisco, and they decided they wanted a rapid prototyping machine that didn't cost a lot, and they decided to work with sugar. So this thing is a, uh, if you've ever worked with a soldering rework station, it's a hot air blower and an XY platform, and then every time they want to add a new level, they, they actually have to pour sugar and scrape it across and then they, they fuse that part on and, and uh, it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. All right, so sometimes though you don't want to make the robot, you actually want to make something and you're not willing to wait around or um, wait around to make something or you don't have the energy and you just want and or and you have lots of money. So uh, luckily the first one is is you don't need money. You can use a printer. And um, uh, I did a project with my friend Allison Kudla and it was almost Thanksgiving and we used Blender, really great pro is there any, are there Blender people in here? They need a round of applause. That's an awesome program. And we just made a turkey, and then we used this program called Pepakura, which you can basically use for free if you don't save your final Pepakura file. And you end up with something like this, which is really satisfying. <laughs> and vegan. Okay, uh, next step up, that's just, you, all you need for that is like a printer. And you probably already have that. Next step up is uh, if you want to spend a little more money, you can buy a cutting plotter. Excuse me. Uh, this is my friend Jeff Rutsky, and he, well, uh, I'm going to make you suffer through it. Hi, I'm Jeff Rutsky, and I love the Kraft Robo. It's smaller than a bread box, and it's an exacto knife on wheels. First, let's take a look under the hood. We have the blade and the registration sensor, and so that'll read crop marks in case you want to print and cut something perfectly. It can slice, dice, and make julienne fries. Here, I want to make a circle with a perforated line going down the middle. 
The next thing I want to make is a stencil. So I'm going to cut this out using lightweight cardboard. And for the holiday season, I want to make this snowflake using some really fancy holographic foil. It sparkles. When you dare to dream, you can cut and assemble just about anything you can imagine. Okay. He's, you can, if you Google him, he's totally obsessed with the craft robo. He actually is responsible. There's a little card in there at the end saying what kind of machine it was because they gave me a, a they gave me a, they sent me a craft robo, which is really cool. Ah, so um, uh, when I so then there's the knitting machine, which is I when I heard about this, I was like, yes, um, because I don't know if you've ever knitted. I I once my family has a sheep farm, and I once uh, sheared a sheep, and then. I, I spun the, the wool into yarn, and then I made a hat, and three days later I lost it, which sucked. <laughs> and so when I heard about the knitting machine, I was like, wait, there's a knitting machine? And not only that, there's a, for, they, used, they, they originally made knitting machines with punch cards, which is sexy, but then there was this model, which, had, which was computer controlled, and you could even hook up a five and a quarter inch floppy disk to it. Ooh. And it turns out uh, this was completely useless for most people and they went right back to the punch card and that's actually primarily the kind that are continue to be uh, created as punch card knitting machines. But this is a really cool rapid prototyping thing. There have been people at NYC Resistor who have said, I'm really cold. I think Alicia said, I'm really cold. And uh, somebody else, I'm not sure who, said, oh, well, let's knit you a scarf. And 15 minutes later, she actually didn't need it, because it's actually kind of a workout. But she had a scarf. And that's George getting his scarf made, I think, or learning about it. Uh, then there's the shop bot. I actually don't know much about these. I haven't played with these. But you can get them in kind of this size. And in general, they usually come in, in a size of 4 feet by 8 feet, because that's kind of a unit of plywood that you can get in the States. Maybe they customize it for, I'm sure they, they so anyway, the idea is it's a big CNC robot that cuts things out really handy for making like furniture or, or bigger things. Uh, of course, here's my favorite, the laser cutter. Things, and things, 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 things. Hey, I'm Eric Skiff, and this is my laser cut and etched laptop stand. I was sitting here the other day, hunched over my laptop like this, and my neck was killing me, and I realized that I could just sit up like this, the world is better. So I needed something like this. And I could see it in my head. I know I wanted my laptop up, and I wanted it simple, and I wanted it to be portable. So I want to be able to take this thing apart, stick it in my bag, and away I go. A couple minutes in Inkscape, and a little bit of cardboard, and I have my first prototype of this. This is the acrylic version with fancy steampunky gear I'm sorry drawings about that. on the side of it. This sure one's all set, but I'm going to make one for a friend. Let me show you how it's made. Okay, so I've got my drawing set up here in Corel Draw. You can see the outline of my stand as well as the gearing that I'm going to be doing in the center. I've got my printer set up. The printer's actually the laser. I'm going to hit print, and away we go. Focus. It's going to autofocus. HEPA filter's on. Compressor's ready. Laptop stand. Fire the laser! Okay, so it's all done cutting and etching. We're now going to take these pieces, put them together, and we've got a laptop stand. Ridge. Warm. Warm. No more neck pain, no more straining. Now I can sit up. It's an awesome thing. Um, I'm showing you a bunch of videos. I'm I know I'm kind of an internet, uh, not an internet, uh, a video whore doing it, but um, I think it's kind of important to actually see the machines and wor actually working, and it's actually much better to go and actually see them working because uh, it will get you addicted faster, but this is the best I can do. 
So this uh, is a student who came, a guy who came to one of the classes and then went home and decided to make a Tintin rocket. And he, uh, he published it and then I made one and I gave him a bunch of feedback because it broke in half. And he remade it and then he made this really awesome rocket stand. And this is just kind of, I love that, that anybody now, anywhere in the world who has a laser cutter or <laughs> Can, can make one of these whenever they want. Uh, the next step up is something I'm actually lusting after, um, is a water jet. And this is a small water jet. And it's about the size of a Lincoln Continental. It's, uh, and this is a really fancy, nice new one. And the way this works is water comes out and it's mixed with some sort of abrasive, depending on what you're cutting, I think you change the abrasive and it comes out really fast. It, uh, your shower comes out at about 70 PSI if you're lucky, and a water jet comes out at 60,000 PSI, which I think breaks the speed of sound, right? And uh, then um, and it will go through anything, uh, titanium, whatever you want. And it's, yeah, I want one. I don't know what I'd make with it yet, but I want to cut something hard to cut. <laughs> Uh, Nervous System uses these. They're um, a couple out of Boston, and on the left is a set of a uh, silicon bracelet, and, and then on the right is a, a pendant, and they take, um, they, what they do is they like to make algorithms that like, uh, look like things in the natural world. So this one on the right looks like a dendrite formation. I really don't know what that means, but uh, they run it, and then you can see there's different shapes, different kinds come out every time, and then they take those designs, and they actually, I believe, they sneak into MIT and use their, their water jet and then sell them. Um, yeah, I like, I think they're pretty. So then we move into 3D printer land, where you can buy, I already talked about the RepRap, and um, if you want, this is kind of an object of lust, the object. This is, uh, it really looks... You can't really tell how big it is, but it's probably about this big. I really don't know exactly how big it is. It's probably about this big. And it's pretty. And um, there's a guy, I looked on the internet, and there's a guy who um, has one of these. And he carries this little skull around because he likes to just take it out and show it to people. Because as soon as people hold it, they immediately want him to make things for them. And uh, it's, it's, it's a 3D printer that has really smooth, really smooth, you can see it's kind of shiny. Yeah. Uh, Bathsheba Grossman, I actually did a video about her, but it was back before I knew anything about compression, and it looks really, I need to read, compress, compress it. She does this really awesome thing where she uh, goes into her studio, and she creates, um, she uses clay, and she comes up with things that look like math, and she actually insists they're art, but basically the idea is she takes these sculptures and then she actually, she makes them and then she actually, then she goes into the 3D uh, software and tries to, re and recreates them in the 3D software and then she takes them someplace and it's actually on her website where she takes it, so you could do this too. And they do this thing where they have a 3D printer. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the 3D printer spits out uh, this metal, um, super tiny, she describes them it, like flour, except heavier, and these little super tiny particles, and it's embedded in like a, a resin of some sort. Anyway, then they take this and they put it in a kiln or an oven until it's just hot enough that they stick together, and then she dips it in bronze. And I bought one for my dad, and he loved it. Um, okay, that's the end of the tool prawn for right now. Uh, okay. So let's say you've made a design with a rapid prototype machine in mind. Now's the time to make it real. <clears throat> the best options are local options because you get to go and touch the machine. Ideally, if it's not yours, they let you push the button because that's the best part. And um, your options are, one, you could make or buy a machine, of course. Um, the other option is my personal favorite, and that's where you get a collective of people together. Maybe it's your hacker space, and you... Um, you either make one together or you buy one together. That's how we did it. We, we collectively shared the, the cost of a laser cutter and 
<clears throat> There's a, we've actually got a bunch of other rapid prototyping machines at, the spa, at NYC Resistor that people can use, which is just really awesome. Because there's this idea of, uh, like, it's not just hacker spaces, but groups of people. I personally think that school is basically dead. The, what, what can replace school is this idea of, creative, of communities that care enough about learning that they're willing to do it, to figure stuff out, and then share what they've learned and document it. I don't know exactly what this is called, but I really like it better than schools. Um, so another option is you could find somebody with a machine shop, uh, with, a, with, with a machine, maybe in a machine shop. Um, you can, strangely enough, places that make trophies usually have a lot of rapid prototyping machines that sit there unused a lot of the time. And a lot of the time they won't even know what to charge you if you go in there and you say, I want to make this thing. They usually have to make it up. So come in prepared to say, like, I'll pay you a dollar a minute for using the laser cutter, or 50 cents a minute, or 10 cents a minute, or make so, whatever you think it's. Anyway, you, the, you have an option here if you can find a trophy shop in your neighborhood. Sign shops are really great for, um, you know, you saw the cutting plotter. They have giant cutting plotters. And if you make friends with them and bring them cookies or whatever it is that they might want, uh, they, might, they might let you use it. You can sneak into college labs or there's uh, tech shops, places that are, gr that are popping up that are uh, commercial places that um, let you use their tools. Uh, if you're in Berlin, you can, use the, you can call up Martin over at laser and laser.de and, and schedule time to go and play on his. He just upgraded his laser from one about this big to one about this big. And you could also do it, you can also send it out. Now, I personally, this is, not, this is completely acceptable. You can do this if you want. But for me, it's missing a few components. I think the community aspect of sharing one is way better than sending it off. Um, and I also like the social engineering aspect of going and finding one in your neighborhood better than sending it off. But if you need to, there's places like Pinoco. They are friendly people, actually. And then there's a place called Shapeways, which is uh, Philips. Uh, they've got sort of a, they're trying something out where you send them a file, a 3D file, and they have 3D printers, and they send you one back in two weeks. Uh, again, I really, I don't want to be, uh, these people aren't bad. I just really think it's, that grassroots is way better for the model of, uh, for the non-centralized manufacturing model of the future that I really am excited about. Okay. So this, I, then, of course, I, every, uh, th this, this idea of sharing what you have, whether you share it with your community, maybe it's just you know, your friends, or you share it on thumb drives or whatever, or you share it on the internet. It's this idea of having commonest object, the idea of, of you know, okay, I made a really freaking awesome butter dish, and if you publish it to the internet, if it really is an awesome butter dish, it might, you might, the millions of them might get made around the world, and I think that that is, I think that that is the future, personally. So uh, this requires a culture of sharing, which I've, most of you I don't need to explain about, this idea, the value of sharing. But the, so many people just don't, haven't got this yet. And um, if you're good at explaining these things, you should explain it to as many people as possible. Um, but just the idea of, hey, I made something, I want to share it with you for the betterment of, of our, our society, our culture, or at least your friends. So. Again, I'm kind of standing against this, or I like this decentralized, home-based, digital design and manufacturing. I thought I said I wouldn't say that again, but I did it. And um, I just think this is really exciting. And right now there's probably somewhere between, well, I know there's at least 100 people who are, who are doing this, who are, who are taking things from their head and just making them exist. And maybe it's as many of a, as 1,000. But uh, I really believe that it should be many, 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 many more. And hopefully some of you, if you're not doing it already. So um, that's pretty much the end of my talk. I'm, I thought it would be fun to actually meet people who are either interested in digital, becoming digital designers or just enthusiasts. Or maybe there are some of you in here who are actually digital designers that I can learn from. And so I thought, let's meet at the Rocket in the freezing cold at 3.15 tomorrow, and we'll go on a walk and find a place to eat and we'll get lunch. I made up a Google group just because I thought maybe if there's an emerging digital designer universe, I think we should talk to each other. So you're welcome to uh, join that and be a part of that. I'll publish this on my blog at briepettis.com slash blog. Probably not for another hour, but I'll publish it later tonight. And then I think that's it.
So, thank you. So if you have questions, you can come up to the mic, and I'll do my best to answer them. Or uh, if there are no questions, we'll, we'll uh, oh wait, I'm, I'm, yeah, about 15 minutes left. So either we'll have 15 minutes to relax, or we'll have some questions. Hello. Oh, yes. Uh, you talk about the design. That's OK. Uh, you don't talk about uh, controlling of the machine, but there are a nice project out there. It's calling AMC. Can you uh, repeat the name of the project? Uh, EMC. EMC. Yeah, but uh, if you need in, in the workflow, there is a, the step in between when you have the design and you have to produce your machine controlling code. And uh, I have a machine and I have a solution for that, but this is every time a hard part. It and, is. Uh, are there some other projects you can point on for the step from the design to make the machine code? Um. I will, I will start off by saying I am not an expert at turning the design into the actual like G-code or whatever it takes to actually make your, your, your machine do what you want it to do. But I know there's, um, I know my friend Zach is working on Replicator G and it sounds like you had, you, you had uh, uh, the three letters that you said. And um, it's definitely an issue that's, because so much of this is still rooted in like, CAD software from the 80s. So you're exactly right. It is an issue if you're making your own stuff. And there needs to be more. I would really love it if there was more standardized ways of making this happen. And I think it's just going to be a battle for the next, until either something emerges that's dominant, or more communities pop up and they can agree on things and develop things that are awesome. Thank you. Uh, uh, guys? Uh, if we could try to keep discussions down so that people can hear the answer to the question, that'd be appreciated. Just, just try to keep it quiet. Thank you. I, hi. I was here. Right ah, here. Hello. Um, could you perhaps repeat your motivation for all this? Um, I, don't, I don't get it. What, what's your motivation? Do you just do it for fun or because you can do it? Why do you do it? Uh, Why? It's clear. It, it seems to be fun. I'd love to do that. But what's your motivation? Uh, the question was, why would I want a rapid product? Why would I want to do this? Why would I want to build machines? Why would I want to make, things my, make, rap, make machines that help me rapid prototype things? And I think for each person who does this, there's probably a slightly different answer. For me, I get this. It really started when I was a kid and I fixed bikes. And when I fixed a bike and it hadn't worked and it worked, I got this uh, elation feeling, I'm not so different from like drugs, frankly. And um, I, I remembered that. And I actually forgot about it until I was much older and I, and I, and I made something and had that same feeling where I, I'd made something. And then for me, I've just kept going. I've found that, kind of, I've, I've been like, okay, I like this, I know it, I'm gonna keep going. And I can say, it will surprise you how absolutely satisfying and the feelings you get from it if you create, especially for a lot of you who, um, who do software, making software move things is really satisfying. If you haven't made an LED blink or you haven't made a servo move or a stepper motor move, there's something actually, I just, I just want you to do it, and if you get if it's if and if you if you get hooked, great. If you don't, fine, move on. But there's some uh, for me. There's something really special about it. And then there's the added bonus of being subversive to the dominant consumer centralized manufacturing paradigm that kind of gets me off. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, I somehow. Uh, like you too, really like doing things by myself, making things, uh, but I find myself always in a field where you showed, uh, the examples you showed, they're either uh, very, very simple, like those uh, flat shapes you can laser cut and stick together after it, like a laptop stand, yeah. or super complex, like those, those nick-nick machines and whatever. Um, 
but I find myself always in a field somewhere in the middle. Uh, well, mechani mechanical objects that are not easy to make in 2D and stick it together. Like, um, well, this is the point where I'm missing a really, really good example. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm into uh, trying to build a coffee roaster. And, uh, well, it's, it's stuff where you, uh, if you don't have access to really, really massive machinery, and you're, well, put it that way, and you're not a, a genius with, uh, in, 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 in making things by your bare hands, you've just lost. At least it, to me it seems like that. Uh, I, for, for those in-between objects to make them, I can't find a really satisfying solution how to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh from what I'm, what I'm hearing you saying is that you're, you're kind of in an in-between state of, of things that you like to make and things that are simple and things that are really difficult. And um, uh, we can talk person to person later, but I think probably one of the things that would be good is uh, getting help. The best projects I've had are the ones that I take on really hard projects that I don't know how to do. And then it's my favorite form of collaboration. It's absolute desperation. And, um, and so that's all I can suggest for right now. Um, hi. Here in the middle. Uh, middle. Hello. Hi. Um, you were talking about how it's a lot of fun to create something, especially if you create it with uh, other people together. And I think everybody who has ever done something can understand that it has had that feeling. But do you really think that this is a model that can, you know, replace the, the economy that we have nowadays? You know, like we have the big vendors who create a million of item X and sell it to you. Do you really think that what you just proposed is able to replace that model or can you just produce your... There are people who produce pieces of art or pretty things or, you know, those nifty little gimmicks that you can use, like a laptop stand, but who would produce, you know, bags to carry your trash around? I mean, that's not interesting in, in a way that, that building your own laptop stand is interesting. So do you think that, that your model is really out to replace the old model that we knew? Okay, so uh, the question was, is this model of, of decentralized cottage industry style manufacturing actually, is it appropriate? And I think, <clears throat> um, I can't definitively say that now is the time to, uh, to do, that, now, that it w this model will be successful, but I will say that like, if there ever was a time, I mean, with the way the economy is going and the way so much of it is sort of topping over, if there is a time to try it out, it's clearly now or soon. And it, I w it wouldn't be a bad idea to put your hand in it now, even just as a hand in it. So later on, if, if you, you know, I, I, when I was a, <clears throat> I took shop when I was in uh, middle school. And my teacher basically said, listen, I know a lot of you are going to just be in this classroom and then you're going to move on. But for some of you, you're going to lose your job and I want to make sure that you can make little toy trucks so that when you lose your job, you can make little toy trucks and sell them. And I haven't made little toy trucks, but I have to say I really appreciate his, like, where he's coming from. And I, and I, so I, I, even if you don't make this your life, if, I, I would suggest thinking about it and thinking what kind of value you can add and what maybe next time you buy something think about well maybe I could make that and even if you don't make it because you realize it would take too much time or be too much of a pain in the ass or you don't have the infrastructure to make it that at least considering it considering it as I think kind of putting it in to the possibility of your skill set uh, yes next um, could, could, could you do a daydream for me could you tell me what machine you're gonna buy in 10 years Ooh. I have a few, I have a, this date, I have this, this is a stupid machine, but I would really like to make a machine that goes on top of a roof and uses this, uh, have you, it's totally toxic, this is a really bad idea, but, um, <laughs> but have you ever used this stuff that's like insulation foam that you put like in your walls or something like this? I want to make a machine that will make, that will extrude, that will just, you'll, I'll probably just have to get like a hundred of these cans and just keep filling it, but it would make a giant sphere like six meters tall on the top of a roof. And then when it's done, I want to push it off the roof. 
and have it ex and have it explode in the bottom. And then I wanted to make another one. Okay, thank you. We have five minutes left, so I think there's time for one more question. Yes, okay. bros. You talked about the idea of um, education or school being dead, and I wondered if that was a personal opinion or if that's something that you've been picking up as you've been traveling, talking to people in different parts of the world, in different parts of the country, um, who are fabricating and teaching each other things, um, since I agree with you, and I'd like to hear more about that. Okay, uh, so I was a teacher for seven years in the public schools in Seattle. And I like to when I taught, I liked to teach in the schools that were the worst te taught ones to teach in, because that kind of gave me a thrill. And it kind of sucked, but it was also really, it was, I was alive. And um, uh, I'm not sure what it's like all around the world, but I know for the most part, we've, uh, at least in the United States, we've made our children and education the lowest priority. And, um, and I think it's not going to change until it has to. But I know for, mo for, for let's, I'm just going to make up numbers, maybe for half the people in the world that go to school and it's really helpful for them. It gives them structure and it gives them, uh, maybe they, they get inspired or they learn something or, or something like this and it's good. But I'm pretty sure it's about half the rest of the people who would much rather be doing something else that is just as valuable. And I'm sure there's probably another group of people who would much rather, you know, sniff glue in the bathroom. But <laughs> I know for a lot of, for, for really, I think there's just a, we're at the time where it's, there, there, we, we're ready for a different educational paradigm that's based on stuff that is actually appropriate and interesting to learn for, and interesting to do for young people. Okay, well, that was the last question. I really appreciate your attention. And uh, this, is, this is good.